Welcome to Rocksaw Productions, where in this video, well, we're here to talk about the latest addition to Star Trek, and we are going to talk about the very first episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, Gary here with Rocksaw Productions. Now, before we get started, I just want to take a second and say thank you for stopping by and checking out our video that we have here today discussing Lower Decks. I know it's something a little bit different than what we normally do here on the channel, but I appreciate you kind of sticking around with me on this. If you like what you see here, I invite you to check out some of the other videos that we have on this channel. And if you really like what you see here, do me a favor and it's more important now than ever before. Hit that thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button, but most importantly, hit that bell notification and make sure you set your notifications to all that way you will make sure that you get notifications every time we upload new content because YouTube, well, they're taking away email notifications from everybody. So thanks, YouTube. So Star Trek Lower Decks has now premiered, at least the first episode, and we're going to go through, and you've seen in all my videos, I have why it rocks and what could be improved. Well, we did this with Star Trek Picard. If you haven't seen it, it wasn't on this channel. I actually did it over on the anti Trekker channel, and you can check out that playlist in the anti Trekkers channel right up there. So I decided, let's do this for Lower Decks, but we're gonna host it here on our channel. And the way that this works is I go through and I pick out five things that I really enjoyed about an episode, or just liked about an episode, quite honestly, and five things that I thought could be improved. Some episodes are gonna be weighted more one way versus the other, but the main idea behind this, it's not all great, it's not all bad. Let's try to find that happy medium, and I will tell you, it was really hard for me on this first episode of Lower Decks to find things that I liked about it. I wasn't keen on it, but let's get started. And we're going to start things off on a positive. The first few shots of this episode. If you wanted to feel like you were in the next generation era of Star Trek, it sets the vibe immediately. You see the starbase and everything. You see us panning inside the starbase where you get to see the Cerritos in basically space dock. And it was a beautiful shot. It reminded me of so many scenes that we've seen in The Next Generation that we saw in Star Trek 2, Star Trek 3, Star Trek 4, Star Trek, well, we don't want to talk about Star Trek 5. But you get the idea. It really did a great job of setting the aesthetic early on that, you know what, this is going to harken back to a continuation of the next generation Deep Space Nine Voyager timeline, and it is not going to deal with like the, um, the timeline from the J.J. Abrams universe. So it's basically set before the destruction of uh, the Romulan Empire, really, for lack of a better term. So while that's good, the first thing that I thought really needed to be improved, the introduction of our two main characters that we have here. And one of them, I already cannot stand. So I'm not a big fan of Star Trek Discovery because of Michael Burnham. Michael Burnham is a typical Mary Sue. She's good at everything just because. Everybody likes her just because. Well, I will tell you, Ensign Mariner, I believe that's her name, comes across very much as a Mary Sue, and they set her up as this in this first opening establishing scene where she's bouncing off the walls and she's, you know, trying to be the fun girl that everybody likes. And, you know, it, it just, I did not like her character from the get go. And I don't know if they are trying to get us to dislike her because we all know they were not trying to get us to dislike Michael Burnham but I disliked her from the word go. And also, the male character was a bumbling idiot from the word go. In so much as, by the way, didn't mention early on, spoiler warnings. From the moment that we saw his leg get sliced open with a bat left throughout the entire episode, he's a buffoon. He's made out to be the comic relief when he's honestly trying to do his best to be a good Starfleet officer versus uh, Mariner, who's basically there as, for lack of a better term, a screw up herself because she can't follow the rules, she doesn't care about the rules, she doesn't want to better herself for society like Picard said everybody did in First Contact. 
I didn't like her at all. I didn't like him at all because of what a buffoon he came across as. And quite honestly, if the roles were reversed and he was the strong character, the confident character, the character that would go ahead and be able to do these sort of rule breaking type of things, and the female character was the buffoon or the butt of all the jokes or whatnot, you know, you'd see people up in arms about that claiming that this was sexist. But because he's a cis white male, it's fair game, right? Yeah, no, not so much. And they have Romulan whiskey. And I bet you thought it was going to be green, but it is actually blue. It's this very beautiful color. Romulan whiskey is against regulation. Yeah, because it's awesome. Right after this introduction, we get our next thing that I really think needed to be improved. And that was the opening credits. The music sounded like something... At first, I'm like, is this Galaxy Quest? And I don't say that to, to dump on ba Galaxy Quest because I love Galaxy Quest, but it sounded like music from a fan versus something that belonged in a first party series. It was terrible. <laughs> And the animation, I thought, for, I have to say, the animation, the ships and everything looked cool. When we get to see the Romulan birds of prey shooting at the Borg cubes, it was really awesome. But everywhere the Cerritos went, you could just, it was a ship of screw-ups. From having it fall into a pulsar, to hitting essentially an iceberg on an asteroid, to getting shot at once in that scene with the Borg cubes and the Romulans and everything, and hightailing it out of there. If this is going to be a ship of screw-ups, you know what, I, I don't wanna see it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in tearing down what we established as a great organization back in, starting in the 60s, moving up through the 80s with the movies, into the late 80s with TNG, into the 90s with TNG, with Deep Space Nine, with Voyager, and even going back into the early 2000s with Enterprise. You never felt like there was a ship of rejects out there. The only one time that there was, it was a Klingon ship, and Worf was sent basically to help kind of clean it up. So I did not like this opening that, again, makes you think that everybody in this episode is a buffoon, is a moron, is an idiot, and shouldn't be there. And I think that's one of the things that I don't like as much about the Orville as other people do, is characters on there have that buffoonery sort of character arc. And it just, if you're a buffoon, you wouldn't get in. You wouldn't be there in the first place. So that is something that I really, really struggled with. As we get taken around the ship by Bombler and by Mariner, we get to see an epic shot out of the back of the ship. And this is my next thing that I thought absolutely rocked. And this is where, looking at where this series is just in one episode, I thought aesthetically, they nailed it. It looks great. I like the uniforms. Uh, I don't love the uniforms. I like the uniforms. I don't like the white stripe. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. And I don't believe that they have to be 25% different. They are owned by CBS Viacom. CBS Viacom is producing and ordered this series. They don't need to be 25% different. But this shot out of the back of the ship, it gave you a sense of scale that really was quite humbling to see. And just, it was a beautiful shot. Even though it was animated, it was a beautiful shot. But from this great shot, we get to see something that just it doesn't make sense. It's like the Chewbacca defense. If Chewbacca should not be on Endor, it does not make sense. Why would they have crew sleeping in the hallway? Are you telling me Starfleet design would design a ship so poorly or have it so overcrowded that you don't have enough crew quarters? This was dumb. It was one of those things that kind of pushed the envelope a little bit of, oh yeah, we don't care if we walk around nude, three quarters nude in a towel. You know, we, we've evolved since then. It wasn't needed. There was no need for this and it was stupid. And it's one of those things that I really hope that we don't like, I'm completely expecting someone to drop trout at some point in time, uh, just because we're gonna see butt cheeks and we already did. And that was the next thing that I thought was kind of dumb and needed to be improved, is as they are in the holodeck, and Bemler, Bemler, is that how you pronounce it? 
the, the male ensign and everything, you know, he leaves because he gets called up to the bridge and you have Mariner who decides to go ahead and change the holodeck program to a workout facility that's all nude. Why? What? This is one of those things where looking at this first episode, it, it's not going to appeal to the core Star Trek audience from a story standpoint. From an aesthetic standpoint, absolutely nails all that stuff like I mentioned. But from a story standpoint, it really doesn't. But it's not something that you can show to Rick and Morty fans who are younger either. I'm not going to want my kids to see something like this. There's no need for it. If it adds to the story, great. But gratuitous nudity and language just for the sake of gratuitous nudity and language, it doesn't add to the story. It doesn't move the plot forward. It is not needed. Now, as Bemler does get called up to the bridge and separated from his compadres, it's interesting to see, and I like the fact that as he is on the bridge, he suffers from a little bit of hero worship. As he gets up there, he sees and is nervous by everything that is going on on the bridge. And again, the bridge aesthetic looked great. If you like the bridge of the Enterprise-D, it will remind you a whole lot of that ship. But I like the fact that he was nervous, not because of anything other than this is what he aspires to to be. He wants to be the confident commander, the tactical officer, the bridge officer, the captain. This is what he is looking to gear his career towards. And I think that's a wonderful thing to show the aspiration of this character and the nerves perfectly legitimate as he's going up uh, and, and, and doing it. I liken it in a better way and it's going to sound weird. Monsters Incorporated, when you have the two kind of janitorial teenagers that meet James Sullivan and whatnot, um, it's hero worship and it's nerves. And it, I thought that they played this off very well. Uh, I did like the interaction between him and the captain and some of the other senior staff as well. It was one of those where he talked too much out of nerves, um, but he also was very quick to try to please. And I thought overall, this was, uh, this was what I wanted to see more from this character and less of the buffoonery. The next thing I thought needed to be improved was, well, the second contact mission, the away mission. It was dumb on so many different levels in so much as the consequences from it. When you have Commander Ransom beaming back up and he's gotten stung by an insect. The biofilters in the transporter should have picked that up right away, that there was a foreign contaminant there. He should have been put into quarantine immediately. And by doing so, I understand you have no story, but when you have no story, you have no story. This reminded me a lot of the TNG episode, The Naked Now, where everybody got drunk and we found out that Data was fully functional. You are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but- How fully? In every way, of course. I am programmed in multiple techniques. It was not an original story by any stretch of the imagination. They basically, like I say, they and, and The Naked Now was a takeoff of a TOS episode. I wish I knew the, uh, the name, but you, you get my point here. The whole thing was so absurd that where Star Trek, the animated series, kind of gets poked fun at and called hokey and, and whatnot, you could look at that and see how it fit in the original five-year timeline of the mission of the Enterprise. This is just dumb. I, and I don't know how many times I got to say that, but they were put in dumb circumstances because of dumb choices by dumb people on a dumb ship, on a dumb show. I'm sorry, I'm yelling. But it's one of those that the whole premise behind, you know, the you know the bug bite that caused the the anger, the madness, whatever you want to call it, space madness. Plotting against me is mine. Taken by space madness. By the way, they're bringing Ren and Stimpy back. I think it's going to be terrible. I digress from that. Um, but the whole premise of that mission, getting them back up, even with Mariner and Bumler being... Bumler, I just realized he's a bumbling idiot. I just realized that as we were filming this. It's appropriate. With him spying on Mariner and everything and, and her giving you know shovels and hoes and whatnot to the natives, everything was done to way over the top in a way that wasn't good, it wasn't compelling, 
and it just wasn't necessary. And I know other people have enjoyed this episode. Anti Trekker, who I referenced earlier, I think gave it a 6.5. Lore Reloaded, another great Star Trek channel, thinks very highly of it as well. Um, I just did not care for it. And one of the biggest things I didn't like about this was something that we were kind of afraid of coming out of Discovery and coming out of Picard. It's a trope with Kurtzman Trek, and that's the language. I mean, when you have, uh, you know, Mariner calling Bumler a bitch, um, when you have uh, the doctor, now on my stream it was bleeped out, but when the doctor drops the S-bomb, holy it's not necessary, and again, it's one of those things you can't bring along the next generation, no pun intended, of Star Trek fans with something like this because you will have people like me that will not show it to the next generation of fans. This is not how you grow and cultivate the fan base. It just doesn't work. And again, it doesn't add to the story, so why do it? For shock value? You know what? We've all heard, you know, Admiral Potty Mouth on... Star Trek Picard. Sheer hubris. We've heard four letter words in everyday life. Having it in a cartoon about Star Trek, you know what, that don't impress me. You know what would impress me? Good stories that make sense with good writing. How about that? Shock me for a change. But I'm gonna leave you on a positive here with, so that's our five things that we have that we thought could be improved. The fifth thing that I liked is as they were in their equivalent of 10 forward, let's call it the bar, you know, you get a lot of references to old Trek. You get references to Khan and the Genesis planet and to the whales and to uh, the Chadich, which was you know, a reference to Worf and Picard. You're gonna be my Chadich from now on, baby. Okay. You, you got a lot, you got references to Spock and Sulu, which was great, but these are all just kind of callbacks versus like building a pond. So it's like saying, do you remember that one time when the Enterprise and then kind of go off on a diatribe. So while I like this reference, do something with it. Don't just make those references and let it sit and fall flat. But these are just my opinions of what I liked and what could have been improved about episode one of Star Trek Lower Decks. For me, there were a lot more things that I thought needed to be improved. I kind of had to pick and choose where we're at just to get to five. But let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Uh, also let me know down in the comment section, out of all the Star Trek that we've had so far, as far as TV series, from the original series, the animated series, Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, and now Lower Decks, what is your favorite Star Trek show. Also, let me know if you saw it, if you liked it, if you agree with me, if you think I'm all wet. Let me know. I want to hear from you guys down below in the comment section. Now, if you do have any other comments or questions, as always, feel free to email me at rocksolidmail at gmail.com. You can hit me up on Twitter at Rocksolid Studios. We are on Facebook at facebook.com slash Productions and Instagram at instagram.com slash Productions. GK. Now, like I mentioned, check out the Anti Trekkers channel where he has our review of episodes 3 through 10 of Picard. He also has live reactions to watching the first episode of Lord X. And also do me a favor and check out my friend Verta Prey 5. He has reviews coming, if they're not up by the time that you see this, of the first episode of Lord X. And he will be going through and doing something similar to me. I don't know what his opinions are to this point. It'll be interesting to see his video after we get this one posted. Um, now, if you do want to help support the future of Rock Solid Productions, there's a couple different ways you can do so. First and foremost, like always, hit that thumbs up button, hit that subscribe button, and is more important than ever, like I mentioned, to hit that um, notification bell as well. That way you are kept up to date with when we do upload new content. You can also go ahead and head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash rocksolid. For as little as a dollar a month, $12 a year, you get early access to all of our video content, exclusive content, and a whole lot more. You can also become a channel member here on YouTube for as little as $1.99 a month. And with that, you get all those same benefits and features. And you also get uh, badges to kind of call you out as a channel member each I think it's three months you go along, that badge changes, gets a little bit bigger, I believe, uh, and there are other benefits on that too. 
You can also go ahead and head on over to our Teespring store on screen right now where we have t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, cell phone cases, masks, lots of cool things for you to check out, and everything that we raise through our Patreon page, through our channel memberships, and through Teespring gets invested right back in the channel here. Um, and then finally, if you are looking to pick up some retro and modern gaming accessories, do me a huge favor, head on over to castlemaniagames.com. And the cool thing over there is he has a feature called Castle Cash. It's his rewards program where the more you spend, the more you earn towards future purchases. And what's really cool is Castle Cash, it's just like cash. So if you have 20 bucks in Castle Cash, you have 20 bucks to spend at the castle. You can also use promo code ROCKSOLID10 to save 10% off of most most items on the website. My overall feeling for this episode using an A through F scale, it's a D. If it weren't for the aesthetics and the sound effects and everything, it would probably be an F. The story for me was an F. Uh, but as far as potential, let's see where it goes. We have a number of weeks to get through this and we are going to be posting these recaps every week here on the channel. My name is Gary, this has been Rocksaw Productions, and our five things we thought rocked and five things that could have been improved about the first episode of Star Trek Lower Decks. I said before, when I heard the name initially, Star Trek Lower Standards, and it appears they've kind of gone that way in a few areas. Thank you for watching, I hope to see you next week.